Sure. Welcome, everyone. We are so excited to have you here at the Young Maker panel. My name is Jean Rue. I'm the Director of Research of the Computer Science Equity Project at UCLA. And it's really a huge privilege to be co-chair of the Young Maker track with um, Brianne Litz, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. We all think the Young Maker panel and poster session are like the highlights of the conference. And so uh, thank you for joining us. And to kick off today's panel, I wanted to share a quote that has been really on my mind a lot lately. It's a quote from Robert Moses, who's a math educator, a civil rights activist, and author of a book called Radical Equations. And he wrote, we believe that the kind of systemic change necessary to prepare our young people for the demands of the 21st century requires that young people take the lead in changing it. And so while this past year has been incredibly challenging for all of us across the globe, and while many adults who wield too much power are making a mess of our planet, I found a lot of inspiration and hope in young people, in the amazing ideas, creations, and resilience of the youth that I work with and the incredible youth presenting on this panel today. So I'd like to say thank you to you young makers. Your out of the box thinking and innovations are a reminder to all of us about the good things that are possible in this world and that the next generation will certainly shape a better place for all. So before we get started, I wanted to let our audience members know that we won't have time for a formal Q&A at the end of the session because we wanted to maximize the time that the panelists speak. But you'll notice there's a Q&A tool in the Zoom where you can ask questions or uh, share comments to the panelists. And panelists will do their best to respond throughout uh, the session in real time. So now to the best part of the conference, let's hear from our young makers directly. So we'll go to our first presenter. And let's make sure our presenters, can you unmute yourselves? This is about solving oil spills in the yeah. ocean. Thank you. I'll mute myself and you can go ahead and start. Uh, we are solving just a problem and we are already going to begin. One second, please. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Maybe should we go to the um, should we go to the next presenter? Would that give you some time to troubleshoot? Um, I would just verify here if they think that's best to pass to the next presenter. I will okay. just inform you. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, so we'll go to the next presenter. Sorry, pardon me while I scroll. Uh, spoiler alert, don't look at the slides. <laughs> okay, here we'll start with our dear friend from Thailand who is talking about the smart air purifying robot. Can you please unmute yourself and present? Good morning, everyone. My name is Hakawut Tamawutikun. My nickname is Army. I am from Thailand. Today, I am so proud to be presenting you my smart air purifying robot. His name is Puppy, and Puppy likes to clean air around him. As we know, big cities such as New York, London, Beijing, Bangkok, etc., have a lot of dust, and that's because they have a lot of people traffic, and a lot of activity causing pollution and dust. One major type of dust that we are very concerned about is called particulate matter 2.5 or PM 2.5. It is a very small particle. Its diameter is less than 2.5 microns. You can imagine it as smaller as 120th of one of our hair. So it can pass into our nose, throat, then into our lungs, and it can damage our lungs by cause 
lung disease if we get it for too much or for too long. You can see people on the street wearing masks and in the building we have air purifiers to clean the air. My idea of puffy comes from a combination of air purifiers and autonomous mobile robot. Puffy works best in the building. He can catch PM 2.5 and other dust like other top quality air purifiers do. However, Puffy is not the same with those top quality air purifiers because one, Puffy is small and light, we can take him anywhere we want. Two, Puffy has four wheels to move from place to place while cleaning the air. And when he found a space, an area that have a lot of dust, he will stop and clean the air with his full power until the air is good enough to breathe. Now let's see how Puffy works. Puffy consists of two systems. It is profile system and mobile and obstacle avoidance system. Both systems are controlled by board IPSTSE. First, I will talk about the air purifying system, and after that, I will talk about the mobile and optical avoidance system. Purifying system. As you can see, Puffy's main body made out of a fully closed plastic box, and we cut a hole in his lid. After that, we put a fan in the hole. Then we cut one a hole in each side of the box and put filters there. The filters are composed of carbon filters, electrostatic filters, and 3M filtered purified filters. These three filters help Puffy to clean, uh, to catch PM 2.5 dust particles. Now, the Puffy's main Purifying system main body is finished, and I will tell you how Puffy's main body purifying system works. When we open the fan, the fan will pull the air inside the Puffy's chamber out. That will make Puffy's chamber air pressure lower. And we all know that air flow from higher pressure into lower pressure. So air outside flow into Puffy's chamber but through the filters. And while the air flow through the filters, the filters catch PM 2.5 dust and release clean air into the chamber. Then the process is start over again until the, the area is good enough for breathing. In in the purifying system, we also use the sensor PMS7003 to measure the amount of PM2.5 in the area. Then the main controller board will read it from the, the result will read the result from the sensor and display it on the screen here. If the result show high PM2.5, the main controller board will order the fan to work harder. If it shows low PM2.5, the main controller board will order the fan to go slower. In addition, my puppy can follow the color light of the air corners in his area. And you can see in the PowerPoint over here that different color meant for different amount of PM2.5 in the area. So now we are moving to the um, can you share this? So now we are moving to the mobile and obstacle avoidance system. In mobile system, Puffy walks by using 4DC motor to control four wheels. Uh, can you share the play? Please. And in mobile and obstacle avoidance system, we, Puffy used infrared distance sensor to measure uh, to detect obstacle and servo motor to rotate the sensor in order to check around Puffy 360 degree. 
But in fire distant sensor it can only check something, some obstacle that is as high as itself or higher. So we use infrared proximity sensor attached to puppy front and back in the bottom level. The infrared proximity sensor can check small and short obstacle. Um, can you go to the last page? I mean, the page before the um, go before this one. Oh, this one. Um, before, okay, the mobile and obstacle avoidance system one. So when Puffy is walking forward, his front moving sensor start detecting obstacle. If they detect something in Puffy's path, they will they will they will check in the left side area and if the left side area is free they will command puffy to go left but if it not it they will check to the right side area if it is free it will control puffy to go right but if both sides of the both area are not free it will order puffy to go backward when Puffy is going backward and found, obst found obstacle, he will do the same process like when he is going forward, except that he will check the right side area before the left side area. And if both side area are not free, he, he will order him to go forward. Um, can you go to the last page? And Puffy's performance system uh, performance testing is puffy purifying performance clean intense mode PM 2.5 more than 500 microgram per cubic meter in 45 times 55 times 40 oh the time's up um so thank you uh, thank you for listening Thank you so much, and especially for presenting after midnight in Thailand. You uh, gave a wonderful presentation. Thank you. And now, is our first group um, able to present now? Yeah, we are. Wonderful. Thank you. I will go up to your slide, and I won't do the spoiler alert. OK, here we are. OK, you, you can say more, please. Can I start right now? Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Zabel and I'm 13 years old. Hi, I'm Lisa, I'm 13 years old as well. Hi, I'm Beth Beef, and I'm also 13 years old. And we study at Learning Custom School. And we're here to present our project to you. The name of our project is Make Education and Solve Enjoy Your Skills in the Ocean, and I really hope you like it. You can go. So the first oil spill that was ever registered on Brazil was from the Sinclair Perfumer boat of 1960, but there were never registered of the affected areas. After that, some other boats spilled oil on Brazilian beaches, for example, the Brazilian Marina of 1978. The one of more repercussion and media happened on Bahia da Guanabara, that is a beach here in Brazil, and it spilled around 1,300 cubic meters of oil, causing a lot of impacts on January 2000. On August 2019, we saw an impressive case of oil spills on Northeast Brazil, and authorities and environmentalists were very concerned about all the impacts on the environment. Also, the volunteers that were helping to clean the sea from the oil spills were doing that manually and without any protection, and this is very dangerous as the oil is toxic to health. So we thought about how we could help to solve this problem by creating a boat. You can pass. So here there are some impressive photos related to the 2019 problem. And you can see what each picture means by reading the captions. You can leave here for like five seconds and then you can pass. Okay, so we started our maker, uh, doing our project in 2019 when we designed a boat. And the prototype is created by a plastic boat or some plastic straws to engineers an Arduino and a bag made of fabric. 
So the bag is connected to the boat by two rods that in the prototype are the plastic straws. And the bag will collect the oil from the ocean and will move to the two engines. And the Arduino will make kind of everything work. It's best. Okay, now I'm going to talk about the following steps that we follow to create this project. The first one was sharing experiences. And last year, our friends came back really thrilled from Padua Latin America. And inspired by them, we decided to create a boat that would be able to solve this problem. Uh, the second step was research the worst problem. And in step, we discovered the UN Sustainable Development Agenda and the problem 14, which is like the low water, addresses resolving the oil spill in the beaches. So we got very interested by it. Can you move on, please? Thank you. Uh, the third step was what to do to solve the problem. In this step, we found out two organizations um, which offer technical assistance for when it's happening uh, an oil spill. And one of them is ITOPF which means International Federation of Petroleum Owners Pollution. And the other one is IBAMA, a Brazilian Institute, that is, which means Brazilian Institute of Oil Owners Pollution. And the fourth step was phototype. In this step, we phototype our boat uh, in the maker space using the available materials that we found here and some we found in our houses. And the last step, was evaluation and writing. And this step was very important because in this step, we received a lot of new ideas from colleagues, teachers, and friends of the, to improve it and ideas to improve it. So it was very important. So, um, you can pass. So we decided that our project to be an innovation, the bag that is attached to the boat needed to be made of a fabric that is biodegradable and correctly discarded. With this in mind, we found um, Misoeco, the first biodegradable polyamide fiber in the world. Furthermore, um, Misoeco is a huge sustainable breakthrough for the whole textile industry. And we're also helping future generations environments by using this fabric that quickly decomposes when disposed on landfills. The fabric was developed by Roda, the Brazilian branch of Solvay. You can pass. Okay, um, our project is an innovation also because it's the first project with this type of technology. Here I have, have the prototype of our pro project. I can I don't know if you can see it very well, but yeah, it's here. You can move on. So we started using and learning about the makerspace when we were on sixth grade. And these are some things that we learned there. For example, apply concepts in practice, learn how to be creative, and develop critical skills. And I think all of them are very important. Um, you can pass. So important lessons that we learn are that you don't have to be in university or graduated to turn the world into a better place. Just be interesting and you can do the difference. And the world needs the difference, so we have to work together. We also think that a very important thing that we learn is that mistakes are very important. So if you really want to do this project, you really believe in it, a mistake won't stop you. And I can assure you that we made a lot of mistakes. For example, we had to stop and bag, but we had a lot of problems, so we had to do it over and over again. And I think those are very important lessons because you can do the difference if you want to. You can pass. So after all this time working on this project, we learned a few things that we wrote on this phrase. And I think it's a very, very beautiful phrase because it passed all the things that we learned so far and I will read to you. So while working on the project, we learned to think outside the box. We learned to think critically. We learned to listen to the opinions of different people. We learned that environmental problems can generate social inequalities that compromise the generations of the present and the future. 
we learn new skills, we learn to use new tools, we exercise our creativity, we make new friends. We were also able to exercise our citizenship once we became protagonists and helped solve the problems that surround us. So thank you for watching our presentation. Thank you very much. Phenomenal job, ladies. Thank you for sharing. And now we'll go to our third presenter. Sorry for flipping through the slides. The Note Diaper Project. Are we ready to present? Yes. Wonderful. I'll mute myself and just let me know when you want me to advance your slides. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. I am Emmanuel and I am 13 years old. I am a grade 8 student from Escola Concept Salvador, Bahia, in Brazil. I am here to introduce the Note Diaper project that AV been developed with my two friends here. You can pass the slide. Okay, so I'm Enzo França. I'm a great student. I'm, I have uh, 14 years old. And Alice will present herself now. Um, good morning. Oh, good afternoon. I'm sorry. Um, I am Alice. I am also 14 years old and I'm a grade nine student. Okay, so you can pass the slide. Okay, uh, now I will tell you guys the beginning and the inspiration of our project. Uh, our idea emerged during our science club class that took place twice a week in 2019, last year. And uh, together we split our class in groups and we start brainstorming and discussing problems. And we use a method called design thinking that is the amplifies, define, ideate, prototype, and test. And the problem we empathized was uh, one friend that had multiple sclerosis. And then we were thinking about how could we help her in the best way. And we saw a lot of videos from a project, like ideas of projects for like us to have an idea. You can pass the slide now. So our project is a diaper that will have a sensor. Uh, when the ring touch the sensor, we'll send a notification to an application for the people that is taking care of tra the diaper. You can pass the slide. So what is the objective of our project? The first is to decrease the discomfort in the for the people who suffer through the multiple sclerosis and decrease the pathogens at time action inside the diaper. So now I'm going to explain a bit about our MVPs that are our minimal viral products. Um, up until now, we had two of them. The first one we built in the last year, which is the one you see on the left. Um, it had one sensor and when it got contact to water or something really moist, it would send a message to an LED light, which would start to blink. Um, and it was all connected through an Arduino, which was connected to the computer. Um, in our second MVP that we built in the beginning of this year, um, prior to the pandemic, um, had two sensors, one that measured temperature and the other that measured humidity. And instead of an LED light, we use a buzzer. So whenever there was a great change in the temperature or the amount of moist, it would, an alarm would start to go out really, really loud. And this time, instead of the, an Arduino connected to the computer, it was Wi-Fi, so it was a bit smaller than the last one. You can pass it. And what are our future plans? Yeah. Um, we want to create our own sensor, which will be ideally biodegradable, disposable, flexible, and hopefully comfortable so that the person 
that will be wearing the diaper won't be well in yeah you know what i mean um and it will be connected to an app or a software that will be able to send um informations and what the notification that the diaper needs to be changed and that's it thank you everybody so much yes Rick, thank for you so much wonderful job friends and now we'll move on to our next presenter from new Hello, jersey everybody. hi everyone um so my name is asher and i'll be presenting this with daniela and we're going to be presenting our project, which was Innovating the World, a functional exterior elevator using the iterative design process and digital fabrications to problem solve and build perseverance. Daniela, can you just introduce yourself quickly? Um, yeah, hello, my name is Daniela and I'm 12 years old. And before we continue, I'd just like to give a shout out to all members of the Dwight Englewood Middle School Robotics Atomic team from last year and that Soham Bafana, Musashi Shavaz, uh, Philip Levinsky, Karen Tiku, uh, Jack Raphael, Matt Zhu, Eche Barak, and Sophia Belshaw. Hi, Dr. Kimasana. Make noise. Okay, the problem. So our school campus is over 200 years old. Some areas are not easily accessible to those with limited mobility. We wanted to find a specific area to fix while maintaining historical integrity and minimizing impact to the environment. Our solution was to create a solar powered outdoor elevator to make Graham House, a three story building from the 1800s more accessible. So we use the iterative design process which uh, we can see in the picture um, that we went around the circle multiple times in order to get the best iteration. We actually changed the project completely uh, at one time. Oh, well, retaining that motif of accessibility. Um, after testing numerous designs, uh, we settled on an elevator shaft with triangular supports uh, that will go out on the building because it would be very difficult to retrofit it in. Um, and an elevator in which the door and top open to be the rail and guardrail. Yeah, the top picture is, well, me uh, building. The first iteration and then a later iteration with um, Philip from robotics. Uh, we can, thank you. Uh, we use 2D design and laser cutting to enhance uh, iteration by iteration uh, of the project. <laughs> Uh, the Lego pulley tangled easily, so we custom designed a double pulley system, um, which took a few, quite a few tries to get right. The circuit is a micro bit with a shield, a breadboard, and a separate power source, a motor controller, DC motor, a solar panel, diode, and backup battery. And the solar panel is to make sure that this project doesn't do that much harm to the environment. Although you could imagine how much energy an entire elevator takes up. So this is a yes. video of our collaboration. And so we're going to be showcasing um, our, our current elevator um, physically in another camera that has members of our team. But right now, we'd like to start by just playing that video. Yeah, that's that's actually. 
in the elevator, in the elevator, you can see that it is solar powered and you can see all the attributes that we pointed out before. And so before we move on, we just like if the in-person people at our school could just showcase the elevator quickly. Yeah. Um, so, uh, is the camera good? Uh, try talking. All right, well, all right, so here's what That's we have. That's the yeah, um, they're yeah. they're um they're not being uh picked up. I don't know if you're able to. There we go. All right, so here's what we have um on the back of it. You can see the micro bit, but I don't really want to turn it around. We have the model of the grand house that we made. Here's that solar panel, and so basically we just push this, and it goes up right. And when it gets to a certain point, right here, you just open this up. And then you let the elevator go down. Like this. And it goes down, and you can just walk out. And this is specifically designed for people uh, in wheelchairs or have a disability. So it is easier for them, also. Perfect, thank you. Um, also, um, um, Sorry, this, uh, so this elevator is outside because putting this elevator inside the building would be very hard and also it would destroy the building itself because it's so old and that would be bad because we don't want to destroy the building. We're just trying to help and make, uh, make it more accessible. So it's much easier and much better um, to put it on the outside of the building. Okay, thank you. So now we're just going to continue if you could just, yeah, perfect. So, um, so solution development and implementation. So we also did research to figure out that it would cost, that it would, that we would need roughly 7,500 watts of electricity to find the amount of electricity that one solar panel powers. We did research to find that about $50,000 would be the cost for the elevator installation and labor. And so um, you can see a couple just clear outlines that for safety reasons, we would need multiple cables that, which we have that add stability and backup. Do the doors were unable to open in transit. We will have 7,500 watts per ride, solar panel stories, and there'll be minimum disruption to the school year. So uh, in addition to online resources, we consulted many professionals, including engineers and architects, and we talked to many um, leaders in our school who were experienced in a specific topic. By attempting to solve real world problems, we can use digital fabrication tools and technology. All the students involved in this project learn new digital skills. We had to go many, go through many drafts before we had a final project. We learned to be resilient and perseverant. Other teachers and people can use our learned lessons to enhance their students' experience. We encourage you to email our team at larryoc at d-e.org. We appreciate the opportunity to come and present to you. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you so much. This Please is our write robotics team. Such a great robotics team, and thank you so much for this presentation. If anyone has questions and answers, please put them in the Q&A. Thanks so much, team. We'll go on to the next session, uh, presentation, please. Thank you for letting us present. It's, Hi, guys. it's an honor to have you. <laughs> Hi, Lily. Can you all hear me? All right, cool. So my name is Waris, and I usually go by Willie. I understand that the project name seems like quite a mouthful right now, and it is, but I assure you that it will make a little more sense in a minute. So before I actually jump in, um, I think there's something that should be said first. In recent years, we have saw a surge in demands and rapid advancements in biomechanics technologies. A quick indicator of these growth is the market sector growth rate. Exoskeleton and prosthesis 
registers a predicted CAGR or compound annual growth rate of 26% and 6% um, respectively. These numbers, of course, doesn't reflect everything, but it is very interesting to say the least. Um, having said that, I believe that biomechanics and prosthesis have major issues that hinders it from growing at its full capacity. Now, there are good and bad news to this. Um, the bad news is that there are quite a lot to consider, given that it is such a um, complex and nuanced field of technology. A very good news, however, is that upon closer inspection, almost all of these issues... Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, have you not... Oh, it, it has not been moving. All right, can you go to one more slide, please? All right, cool. <laughs> now, there are good and bad news. The bad news is that there are a lot um, to consider, as you can see from the picture. A very good news is that um, upon closer inspection, almost all of these issues are derivatives or analogs of a more fundamental piece of technology. I'll explain what I mean in a minute. Can you go to the next slide, please? And then double click on the video. Okay, cool. So here's an example of an arm exoskeleton that I built a couple of years back. Um, although in hindsight, the final product is not extremely intriguing on its own, it was a stepping stone which gave me practical insights into the problem of exoskeleton and other biomechanics by extension. Precisely that one of the biggest cornerstone technology of the, biomecha of the biomechanic field is the actuation technology. So I, I, I guess a quick, um, nice little um, definition page would help. So actuator per my definition means that it, it, it is any system that converts stored energy of a certain form into external mechanical work. And that's it, I think we're ready. Can you please go to the next slide, please? And then next slide. All right, so let's take it from the top. Uh, my project is about an investigation and subsequently optimization of supercoiled polymer actuator for generalized biomechanical applications. Next slide, please. So here's a, a quick video of, of what a super coy polymer artificial muscle is. So as you can see from the video, it's this, the, the, the black little coil is made from um, monofilament nylon, which is readily available and is extremely cheap. And here you can see my um, hair dryer. And when we, you apply heat to it, the, the muscle contracts. So that's why it's called artificial muscle. So first let's talk about the elephant in the room, shall we? So what exactly do I mean by the word ideal? Next slide, please. So what exactly do I mean by the word ideal? It certainly doesn't sound very quantifiable or tangible. Next slide, please. For that, let's reframe the question. Um, what exactly are we looking for when choosing the right actuator for biomechanics applications? Next slide, please. As you can see, there are a lot of factors to consider with each of them being extremely difficult to explain and consequently would take me hours to discuss. Next slide, please. Moreover, emph oh, no, you just clip, you skip the slide. Yeah. Moreover, emphasis on each issues are extremely case specific and depends heavily on the applications that you're looking to apply to. Right. Next, next slide, please. So, for the sake of time, let us apply one of my favorite engineering method, the black box. Over a period of two years or so, I crunched the numbers, read lots of research papers, and consults professors and other people, and came up with a selection matrix that take in, takes in a bunch of actuators technology with potential and spits out the best fit candidate with it being the super coy polymer actuator. Next slide, please. So what I wanna talk about next is that um, one of the most attractive quality of SCP actuators is their, uh, actually their ease of fabrication and extraordinarily cheap uh, cost. So the first step of my project was actually to design a manufacturing system that will allow me to re uh, create these actuators with high precision and high repeatability, and also high tunability in their manufacturing parameters. So next slide, please. So you can notice that this is actually the same slide, but with um, the manufacturing parameters being highlighted in orange. So these are the things that we can change and measure the, the final uh, product if there are any changes in the final product. Next slide, please. So here's a, a, um, a quick um, machine that I built. It, is used to, uh, it is used to coil the artificial muscle. And you can see that um, in, the, in the video, there's um, the nucleation of, of said muscle. Yes, that's it. Next slide, please. 
And this is um, an, a PID controlled annealing um, oven, which is used to remove residual stress from the wire. And it's also one of the manufacturing process. Next slide, please. So first, next, we want to test the performance of these muscles, right, uh, with different uh, parameters. So this is a testing jig that I set up. Um, so you apply vari uh, variable loads on it, and, um, and, then you, and then you can see from the top right picture, there's a, a time of flight sensor, which you can record real time distance, which you can then calculate using basic math into um, real time um, angular position. And with that being said, you can also calculate uh, the, the real time energy conversion efficiency, which is actually a very big deal in, um, in actuation, uh, act, um, actuator uh, in select selecting act um, actuators. And also, this will come in extremely handy when you're trying to apply um, advanced um, actuation control systems like PID or fuzzy logics and stuff like that. So um, this part of my work has been a continuation of exploration of manufacturing parameter of SCP actuators, which has been, uh, which has been uh, explored to a degree. I, I leave uh, lo lots of research papers in the website page. So it's not that, um, and also the testing jig is not that um, interesting, but I assure you that um, setting a solid protocol and manufacturing pro process and having a precise testing equipment is, is, is quintessential um, in helping me in the next steps. So what we have yet to do is, and here's the, uh, the small picture. So we, we want to implement feedback control for actuation. Um, so, and this is not novel, it has been done before, but here's the, the novel part where, where the novel part comes in. We want to explore the dynamic of the system when we add a bunch of um, other SCP muscles, like so like bigger system. And there's going to be a, a lot, 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 lots of other things to consider. And also we want to um, investigate how to improve energy conversion efficiency which is actually a very big thing. So, and this is the grand picture, right? We want to be able to implement this into actual um, exoskeleton prosthesis around the world. And these are extremely cheap and has potential to be um, uh, quintessential in helping uh, people who lost limbs or ability to move, regain their, uh, their, those ability. And this is very, extremely ambitious, but I have uh, um, big hopes. And here's my um, contact. I would love to get some um, uh, help or, or contact if you guys have any problem or any suggestions, please email me, worksite page. And that's the, the next page is the worksite page. That's it, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Willie. Yeah. Phenomenal work. Thank you. Keep it up. <laughs> wow. All right. So we have our next presenters from Brazil. Hi, good afternoon. Today we're going to present our project of the Favlearn, that is the shelter project. And um, but before we're going to present our shelter. Ah, okay. Just a minute. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we have a presenter here that is G Gabriel Frota, and he's as participant and not as presenter. Oh, thank you, thank you, guys. So, Thanks for letting me know. Thank you. Go guys, you're ready to present, go. Good afternoon. Today we will present our Fabulous project, The Shelter. But before start the presentation, we will present ourselves. Hello, good afternoon. I am Rafael Hassan. I'm 13 years old and I'm from Scholar Concept of Faith Group. Hello, I'm Gabriel Rabelo. I'm 12 years old and I'm from Scholar Concept 7th grade. Uh, hi, my name is Rodrigo Sturaro. I am 14 years old, I'm from eighth grade. Our idea is to make a big sustainable shelf that fills the rainwater, it's so drinkable. Our project just connects with the global goal number six, which is only drinkable water and sanity for everyone. Global goals are the number of goals which ONU made to try and reach a in 2030, as would solve a lot of planet's problems. So, to present our project, we are going to use a method for problem solving called the design thinking. It has, has five steps, empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and test.
so the first step is empathize. Uh, so to get connected with the problem, there is a lack of potable water. We uh, started looking around us and we uh, noticed that around us has had many droughts that are really dry places and we connected with the people that live in that places because they really try in country water. And uh, another project, the, another problem that we saw is in El Salvador, that is a different place. We saw that they are dangerously running out of water. And through empathy, we try seeing, uh, we put ourselves in their shoes and saw how they passed the, uh, their days. And in the second stage, the fine, we try to uh, decide our project. That we, then we brainstormed and came with the idea of a shelter that we future world. Then in step three, we start to do sketches who the shelter would, would like in the paper. After the sketches, we started to look at the details of the shelter and who it would work in the inside. Um, we thought that it should have a roof that will be able to shape it in a way that will get more water than a normal roof. So we thought in doing it like a triangular shape and roof. So it, the water would fall there and go down to bamboo tubes until the first filter that would take out the part, particles from the water. And then this water would go to the second filter that would be a big metal box and exposed to the sun heat. And the water would be there until it got near to the boiling point. What would kill the microorganisms. Then uh, a, a little hatch in the tubes would open and it would go somewhere that would store this, this water until it gets more cold so people can drink it. Uh, the idea is it to be easy to build and cheap to build. Um, we, while we were in school, we got to do a prototype of it. We tried to use the minimum materials possible. So by doing this, we could see uh, how would be the size, like relatively the filters, how it could be in or out of the shelter, and how it would work. The problem is the lack of water. In your project, the solution for that. Because help you buy future water to places that don't have it. This was, this was our presentation and thank you for it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Wonderful work, guys. We have our, our next presenters bringing light to the community. Uh, let me know when I can start. Go ahead. Can I start? Thank you. So hi, everyone. In this presentation, my group and I will describe the journey of all 85 students in grade nine at Avenues the World School in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and how they concentrated on making their ideas become reality through project-based learning. While learning about different physics topics, such as electricity, circuits, and radiation, we decided to focus on integrating communities around us by recognizing the reality that we live in. To reach this goal, we chose to create solar-powered streetlights in order to assist the residents of the community right in front of Avenues, which is Jardim Panorama, which is shown on the images, in solving one of their main problems, which is the lack of quality lighting. Through multiple assignments, we were able to deepen our learning and improve our skills, including, for example, metacognition, critical thinking, problem solving, and persistence, which helped us rise to the challenges of life and grew our awareness about the world that we will inherit. Furthermore, the experience taught us not only how to build and operate street lights, but also how to have conscience of what happens in our surroundings, how we can be impacted, and most importantly, how we can impact others. We can. 
So to define how to address the problem in the community streets, we went through the design thinking process, starting with the empathize phase. During an event in the school's auditorium, we had the chance to analyze the subject of electricity through different lenses and means. We looked at poems, pictures, and even the movie, The Boy That Harnessed the Wind, and became quickly inspired to begin this project. Our next step was visiting the community next to school, guided by a local inhabitant. Only then we started to witness the challenging lives and real problems the residents had regarding the lack of electricity. Children could not play after dusk and parents were afraid to go home after work, for example. Realizing this problem was near and approachable was fairly engaging and provided the project a precise path. So after the provocation event and understanding the problem of the community, we brainstormed some of the ways that we could try to solve this issue. So after a lot of discussions, we came up with the idea of using solar panels to put together the street lights because it would be a possible, affordable, and helpful way. However, to be able to build it, we would have to gain some knowledge about solar panels and how does it work. So how does the sunlight would make the light turn on, how to connect all the parts together, and many more. Therefore, with that said, our first activity was to do a stop motion in groups. With the stop motion, we would be able to learn about soil radiation, waves characteristics, and their interactions with matter, and also how electromagnetic waves work and how they can be used to generate electricity. Not only the topics about solar energy, but also improve our collaborative skills. You can go to the next one. At that point, I already knew crucial aspects regarding solar radiation and how to convert it into electricity. However, we still didn't know how to connect all the devices and how to measure electrical energy. That is when we conducted a lab experiment by connecting a power supply with LEDs, using wires and measuring it with multimeters, to which we created a lab report. Our teachers presented a research question that we would later on answer in our conclusion. The exactors and tests recreated our hypothesis and then prepared the background research to support our claims. By synthesizing ideas and information from multiple sources, we advanced our comprehension of voltage, current, power, and many other topics. Yet yeah, there were still more steps to complete, such as registering all of our methods, drawing diagrams, producing tables, creating graphs, and even writing our conclusions. This activity's purpose was to enrich our knowledge about the subjects and to better prepare ourselves to accomplish our main goal, creating our solar street light. You can go to the other slide. Thank you. As we understood the problem we had and the scientific concepts of the street light bulb, that were light bulb, structure, battery, battery controller, and the solar panel, we started building the prototype. To build the prototype, we looked forward to see if it would be the best structure and a good fit in the street. After the a whole year finished its prototypes, we brought them to the one event where there were teachers and other people who evaluated our prototypes to bring out the best ones so that we could apply them in the future. We partnered ourselves with the NGO called Litro Gilus that helped us build the top light, uh, the top part of the street light bulb that would be installed in the future of our project. So this experience was indescribable, as you can see into this presentation now. We learned about circus while helping the community next door. We had the opportunity to chamfer our friendship bone, something you can see in this picture. We met new people as we integrated two very different social classes. We had a deeper learning in many subjects, such as how to build poles, electrical and solar radiation, waves, how to share ideas, and for me, the most important one, how to make real life decisions without the help of adults. We had little time to prepare everything, but with the help and effort of everyone, we were able to finish it. So the improvement of our collaboration skills were evident. We encouraged discussions as we created real change outside and inside the classroom, finally impacting our surroundings in a positive way. You can pass. So our next steps would be to install the street light poles that we built together with the oh, NGO Leaders of Light, or Litrilos in Portuguese. But before we do that, we need to verify the legal authorization for the installment of the polls in the big, because since we're not legally allowed to do that yet. The whole process was already delayed because of COVID, and we are working to install them very soon, hopefully in the next couple of weeks. And to make sure we choose the best spots for the polls, we measure the position of the sun throughout the day and install them in the spots that hit the, 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 the most sunlight uh, all the area around. So for us, since the light bulbs themselves, we'll look for one to two people from the community who will take care of each one of them and they'll install them together with a professional person from Avenues in the interest of the community, which you can see on the picture on the right. Um, and this is very important important because the light bulbs are in maintenance. So this will be the person who will clean the solar panel and then will also contact us if anything happens to the light bulbs 
or uh, if the battery runs out, for example. And it's also important because uh, they'll take more care of it because they'll know that it's their LiPo and that they were the ones who installed it. Next slide, please. Yeah. And last but not least, the message that we leave behind is that as a group of students and teachers from Avenue Sao Paulo, build resistance by providing members of the Panorama community a basic vision by changing their lifestyle. Build, build and create resilience by not giving up when difficulties appeared. This was essential to the promotion of meaningful change and impact to our surroundings. There's even other projects, such as the Pressing Project, which have in mind to renovate other green spaces in the surroundings of the school. What we're doing, what we're doing right now is just the first step of a larger plan to help the community around us. In the name of everyone, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Phenomenal work. Thank you all. Thank you for these incredible presentations. Thank you. Um, and finally, there was one uh, panelist who couldn't be here today. She's juggling school and work, but um, I just wanted to acknowledge she had a really amazing project called Afrofuturistic City. Um, her, name, her name is Janique Berridge. And so if you ever meet her in New York, let her know that we were so glad that she shared her work uh, in the proposals. So thank you everyone for attending this event. Um, there's one minute to the top of the hour. I know there's another amazing uh, panel up next, so please attend that as well. Uh, final thank you to all the incredible students, um, youth, and of course their teachers and families who supported them in this great work. Um, if you had any questions in the Q&A, um, I'll, we'll leave this open in case people want to continue answering questions or um, uh, sharing comments in the Q&A section. But um, thank you. Thank you, incredible Fabler and community. It's been an honor. <laughs> it really has been. <laughs> Thanks. It's amazing um, for us to see that we have a shared heritage as human beings and we have a shared future. Mm, that's really beautiful, Daniela. You know, and discoverers. True, true. These, uh, your work is really incredible, all of you. Like, you know, it's uh, proof that age isn't, age is not the barrier <laughs> to uh, brilliant thinking and incredible uh, creation and work. So, you know, again, thank you for your wonderful presentations and the educators here, thank you for your incredible work. Um, it's the, the most important profession in the world, our teachers, right? <laughs> um, and I know our attendees are slowly leaving the room going to the next session, but um, did anyone, anyone else say anything before we all close out the zoom room i would uh would like to say thanks to everybody for the attention and this was a really nice experience for life and i hope to participate in another one like this in the future wonderful i can't wait to see what you create in the future enzo thank you for being here thank you thank you, thank you very much for the opportunity thanks thank you thanks so much for presenting Hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day or night. And in Thailand, I hope you sleep well now. <laughs> this is your hard work is done. <laughs> and oh, my dog wants to come say hello. Here's my dog. She says hello. <laughs> hello. <laughs> all right. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Congratulations thank on incredible you. presentations. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank also, you. thanks Bye. for your patience. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much.